Aloha kako. Welcome to Anahola Baptist Church with Pastor Kenny Elledge. We are searching the Holy Scriptures today, so get your Bible and ekomomai, join us. The purpose of my sermon today, I want to uh, mention a little bit about today and tomorrow. Today is Father's Day. Tomorrow's a, a newly recognized federal holiday called June Juneteenth. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Um, it it's Juneteenth, Juneteenth is a memorial recognizing the emancipation of the slaves. And uh, June 19, 1865, that was uh, made, it was established as law and it was actually recognized then. One of the primary uh, elements of this form of slavery that was abolished uh, was the slave trade. And that had to do with Africans being stolen from their homelands. Uh, often, and actually almost always, it was the case that they were stolen by fellow Africans, warring tribes, competing tribes. Uh, but nonetheless, um, they were stolen. And, and they were stolen, most of them were stolen for the express purpose of being sold into the slave market, which was very uh, beneficial for the Africans who were able to steal their their uh, um, rivals rival tradesmen or tribesmen but also for the Europeans and the Americans who bought those people and I say that because Exodus 21 16 says whoever steals a man and sells him and then it says this and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death and yet that transatlantic slave trade lasted from the 16th to the 19th century among a society who at least held to Christian worldviews without a doubt, that's the truth. The matter of history is quite complicated and I think this matter of slavery is quite complicated and I'm not trying to teach you about it this morning really. But I wanna ask you what your reaction to that text was when I read it. Whoever steals a man and sells him and anyone found in possession of him shall be put to death. I sent that text to my family yesterday, which is a, a large group of people here on this island. And among them was uh, a gal who is very different from us, politically speaking. She's very progressive, very progressive, very liberal. Uh, and she's loved by the family. And everybody unanimously responded with a hearty amen to that text. And the reason why I bring this up is because I want to see if we respond to that text because scripturally that is true, or if we respond to that text because of where we are as societal members. Exodus 21, verse 20 and 21, just a few verses down from that text, says this, When a man strikes his slave male or female, with the rod, and the slave dies under his hand, presumably this is on purpose, he shall be avenged, and I believe that means he shall lose his life. So there is a value to that slave's life. You can't murder your slave. But if the slave survives a day or two, indicating the owner didn't mean to murder his slave, I believe, didn't mean to intend or intend to kill the slave, which would be a loss for him, he is not to be avenged, for the slave is his money. Now, what's your visceral reaction to that? Are we going to say amen when the scriptures align itself with where we are as a society? Rightly understood, properly understood. It's harder to say amen to that when we see the slave is his money. 
we realize there's a context to Scripture, isn't there? What does it mean, the slave is? Well, I'm not going to get into that. All I'm doing is a little social experiment to see where your heart is when it comes to Scripture. Are you more comfortable within the framework of being acceptable to society or to the authority of God's Word? It's hard. I read that text. I'm going to admit to you. That's a hard text. The slave is his money. How do we understand that? But what about in light of Father's Day? Interestingly enough, these texts that I'm about to read surround the texts that I just read to you previously regarding if a man steals another man. That man's life is forfeit. These texts surround that text. Exodus 21, 15 says, Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. Verse 17 says this, Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. And you say, well, that's just Old Testament. You know, that's just back then in the Old Covenant. We're not under the Old Covenant. We don't need to pay attention to this. One of the questions that comes to my mind is, was this moral? Were these commandments moral that God gave Israel, Moses, to implement into the, the life of Israel. If you say they're immoral, then what does that say about the character of God? But I want to add this. Jesus references this text when he's talking to the Pharisees about the traditions that they use to replace Scripture. You see, the Pharisees were men of their age as well. They liked divorce to be easy, and they liked other things to be easy. And one of the things they created was, in, this, in different translations, it, it's the tradition of what's called Corban. So your child is yours. And the idea of honoring our father and mother is not just when we're children, but as we age, we also are required to make sure our parents are provided for in their estate, in their elderly condition. And so what this tradition said is, no, when you claim Corbin, that means as you grow up and your parents are in need, what was to be theirs by your responsibility as their child, no, you give that to God. And, and this tradition, that's not law. It's not what God provided for in the Pentateuch and the Torah. That's replaced by this tradition that, that's supposed to be supposedly pious. And Jesus says, do you not see what Moses said, that those who revile their parents should die? He uses that as an argument to why you must not dishonor your parents. That's the litmus test. That's how important it is to honor your parents. All right, that's all just pre preliminary because uh, I want us, when we come to gather together around the Word of God, I want us to be serious about it. We live in this world out there where we are pressured to think a certain way. And you better believe that comes into the church. It's always something we have to be concerned about. So as a pastor, I need to be, in a sense, combative with what the world is saying as it infiltrates the church. The world will be the world. I understand that the world's gonna be the world. But my responsibility is towards you. And I want you to take stock about the way you see scripture in relationship to the world because it matters and it matters much with regards to what we'll look at today. Father's Day is a day on our calendar that we've only really been observing as a nation uh, for about 110 years now. I think the first Father's Day was 1910. It was not officially recognized until the 70s as a holiday. But the tradition goes much further back in history, back to the year 1000. That's the new baby. We're thankful for your baby. It's good to have you guys here today. Um, praise the Lord for new life. Uh, and it goes back to the celebration of St. Joseph's Day, a thousand years. So the tradition is a longstanding tradition 
but we celebrate this day as a day to, to honor our fathers. And yet, in some ways, I think it's, it's a very hypocritical thing to do in our culture, isn't it? I don't think our culture honors fathers. And there's a, a, a whole handful of ways that we could describe it. I thought of that, should I give you a bunch of statistics? Should I, how should I approach this? Uh, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna give you a little bit of my own experience just from growing up uh, and what I saw in regards to fatherhood. Growing up, I, I recognize that the responsibility of fathers that God gives to fathers is demeaned or absolutely abhorred in our culture. That men are primarily responsible for what happens in the home, what happens in the church. The responsibility is on men. God has put that there. Uh, you often hear the phrase, who has the final word in, in the house? And I remember my pastor joking around, well, I always have the final word, it's yes, dear right? And, and a, certainly there's wisdom to that because what we mean by final word is not a tyrant, right? We don't, we don't believe as, as men that we are un, always right <laughs> without question. But the, the, the matter of responsibility does not, is not determined by always being right. It's about who is going to be held responsible before God for decisions made. And every man knows that we are not perfect and we don't have all the answers, which makes bearing responsibility very difficult. But it does not mean that we shirk it or we make fun of it or we should abhor it in the home. That's one of the central ways that we honor our fathers is that we recognize that they bear a big responsibility before God. It's not a light thing, and it's not a small thing, and it's something that our society does not value, and not only does it not value it, it wants to destroy it. It wants to just demolish it. It does not want you fathers to be responsible. And yet scriptures in the New Testament tells fathers not to provoke our children to anger. That means we're involved. But on the other hand, bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. That's responsibility laid upon us within the day-to-day -day activity of the raising of our children. Second, fathers, the world says, and, and these are things that I, I've seen, in my lifetime, fathers are better when they don't hold to biblical morals. They don't lead in righteousness. A father who stands his ground on matters of biblical morals and practice is antiquated. He's living in the past. He's living with a sense of patriarchy that is dying and, and fading away. He's holding his household to the standards of God's word, and that's often looked up upon as unrelenting and unrealistic. And often it's described as pushing your children away from God. After all, uh, our children cannot be saved by the law, by law, requiring them to be in church, requiring them to do what's right. Instead, we are telling our fathers today to stand back, to, to hands off when it comes to pushing your morals or your traditions, the way that you were brought up on your children. Let them be who they are. Let them find who they are they are. Fathers shouldn't force their children to do what they don't want to do. Fathers need to let kids be themselves and find themselves. If they want to watch TV all day or play on the internet or play games or phones or social media, let them be. And what I found to be true regarding the stress placed upon fathers in this regard is that it only goes one way. Because nowadays, fathers are, we are going so far in a society to say that you should bring your kids to that drag queen story hour. You sh it, so there's no neutrality in righteousness, in other words. You will be called upon to direct your household in, in a way, in a, in a direction. It's just what voice are you going to listen to? You're going to listen to God and direct your house towards righteousness, or you're going to listen to a word, world that is corrupt and despises God and despises his authority, 
and leads your children and your household away from God and away from righteousness. I knew a man, a, a, a believer in the church, who told me once, he had young children, and he told me, you know, I, I know that uh, it's not in my responsibility to bring our children to God, so if they don't want to go to church, I don't make them go to church, and, you know, I don't, I don't decide who their friends are, and these are, these are young kids. These are not grown adults. These are children in his household. Every one of those children have walked away from the faith. Prison, drug use, pregnancies out of wedlock, every one. And, and they're just living in it. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen within the Christian home as well. But if, but if you give your children over to this world, they know what to do with them. They know how to make them assimilate to themselves. And you have a responsibility to nurture and, and to rear your children in righteousness. Third, fathers are best when they're irresponsible, <laughs> when they're just our buddies. Uh, this is something that I've seen a lot, and this is sort of a rejection of work at its root. Uh, I've seen in my lifetime the idea that men work too much be the great sounding board of the way that we describe a father. He, he's a neglecting father. Let me say this. I don't know a single father who works too much. Not one. But what we want is a dad to just be a buddy, to hang out with us. Right? I, I knew a dad. He was the cool dad on the block. Unbelieving uh, man and unbelieving children. And we went and played basketball with him. I, I got to be fairly good friends with him. A little bit later, as I got to know them more, that dad introduced his son, his teenage, or his pre teenage son, to pornography, to movies of every sort, to how to objectify women, to partying lifestyle. To, to everything you can imagine, but he was the cool dad. He didn't work, he had a disability, uh, but he could play basketball and all of that. But, but I, as I grew up, I sort of saw him in a different light. And I saw his son, I was son, my friend, how he turned out. I, at least he has one divorce. He's got addictions. He's, his, we, we have to be careful about listening to the way the world deems us to be. To, to be in lineage or to be marked by the wisdom of the world is to be marked in contrast to the wisdom of God. And how do we see the wisdom of God? Well, today I just want to look at Genesis 2 uh, a little bit. And we're going to go a little bit from there. God willing, I won't keep you very long. I do have a lot of notes, uh, but most of them were through, halfway through already. So uh, stay with me. I know it's warm these days. The creation mandate found in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 begins with God creating man, male and female, in his image. We have God's image stamped on us. We belong to God. That's what Jesus says. Render to Caesar which Caesar, render to God that which is God. God's. We belong to him. He defines and determines who we are and what we do. And I know we hate that as, as fallen people. I know the world despises that message. That anyone can determine the parameters of life but myself is heresy in the world. We kneel at the foot of humanism, at the, at the idol of humanism. And ourselves are that standard now. We do what, whatever we want to do. Anybody tells you otherwise, they are a tyrant, right? They are imposing on your right. We believe that we are gods ourselves, but that is not the truth. We have been created by God, made in his image. We belong to him, and that's a good thing. We relate to him. When we know the truth of why we were created, it is good. God made all things good. Well, today 
it's Father's Day, and I'm not going to focus merely on what it is to be a father, but I want to see what in creation defines a man. And if we will live in accordance with the creation mandate and God's purpose in creation, as men, we will be good fathers. We will be good husbands. We will be good men. This is not all there is to say about manhood by any means, but the first thing I want to say is men, we work. Men work. One of the patterns of the creation story is the way in which God creates man, the order in which he creates man, and then surrounds him with the garden. Notice this, verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Notice, this is the context, verse 5. No bush of the field had yet in the land, no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain in the land. There was no man to work the ground. Nothing was there. There's no garden yet. And a mist was going up from the land, and it was watering the whole face of the ground. Verse 7, then the Lord God formed man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living creature. Now look at the pattern, the order. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground of the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. And the tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. Now go down to verse 15. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. What? What to do? What should he do? Work and keep it. So God made man from the dust of the earth, promptly promptly surrounded him with a garden, placed him in the center of it, and said, work, I provided this place for you. All you need is here, work. So often we see today that work is just a matter of the fall. We only work because of the fall. No, we work because God created us to work. And when we do not work, men, we are not men. Adam was made to work before the fall. Secondly, we can derive from this that Adam being called to work was illustrative of what God had already done. You know, there's only one other person up in this point in the scriptures who has worked. And who is that? God. Genesis 2, 1 through 3 says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them And on the seventh day, God finished his work that was done. And he rested on the seventh day. Do you see a pattern here? So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done. Here is where the Sabbath principle was introduced in creation, not in Exodus chapter 20 on Mount Sinai. Here. And who worked? God. Six days creation, seven day rest. What are we called to do? Six days work, seven day rest. Do you see the implication? We're made in God's image. We are to be workers, men. And we do not fulfill the image of God if we don't work. Now you say, oh, I have a job. How do you perform your job? Are you lazy at your job? You can go to work and receive a paycheck and not be diligent in work. I used to be a county worker, I know. We had 15 minutes, the, the, the union got us 15 minutes in between our lunch break. And we had to stretch that out because we didn't want to bother the golfers. And we didn't have enough work to do for the whole lot of us. So we had to stretch that out to a good hour and we're just sitting there, you know, Ad- not adolescents, we're 20 years old or I don't remember how old I was. We're sitting there for an hour playing Sudoku, you know, because we can, because we're not working. We're getting paid, but we're not working. And then lunchtime comes around. That's an hour and a half, supposed to be a half hour. And then the next break comes later. So we have three breaks and we're probably breaking for, I don't know, three and a half hours. 
and getting paid, and that's what we're supposed to do, and that was our day's work. That's not a day's work. I might have gotten paid, but that wasn't a day's work. Thankfully, I had a house that I had to go home and and work on that house. So I did that for the rest of my day. So God kept me working. But but the point is, we have to be careful by by being told what a day's work is and actually doing a day's work. Right? And I'm not saying I'm not saying I have the ideal parameters for what a, a day's work is for you. But I but I will say this, we have to be careful because one of the ways that men fail is that we become lazy and we don't work. Now we also are aware that we can overwork. Uh, I've been guilty of both, underworking and over, overworking in my life. I'm trying to learn how to rest a little bit. But we need to be understanding, we need to understand for today's purpose that we need to work. But the third principle with regards to work is therefore man was made to glorify God with his work. We are not just part of the cogwheel of the economy in our work. You know, we're a capitalistic society and in that sort of economy, all of you matter. That's why we want every woman in the workforce, including moms, because you're part of the commodity of our system. And that is not the way we need to view ourselves in the first place. If we will rightly glorify God with our work, we will see ourselves working within the creation mandate that God gave us. We work in obedience to God. We work to give God glory. Well, what is one of the ways we work to glorify God? We know it's not easy. Chapter 3 says there's a fall and work is not going to be easy. How do we glorify God in relationship to the fall? Well, it's not in laziness. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3, 10 through 12, for even when we are with you, we would give you the, this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. That's a New Testament commandment. For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Getting at everybody's busy business because they don't have anything to do themselves. Now, such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their living. But that is not all there is to say. That relates redemptively to what the scripture also says in relationship to us being diligent in work. First Thessalonians, this is the, the letter beforehand, chapter 4, 11 and 12. To aspire to live quietly, to mind your own affairs, to work with your own hands. Sounds very much like... Second Thessalonians, sounds like he's a preacher, right? He's got to repeat a lot of the things that he says as we instructed you. So he already instructed them before then. But listen to this, so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. So it's not just for your own sake that you work hard. It's so that you don't require what somebody else has worked hard for your own self. You see, what people do with their energy then, their time, and what work they produce, what they, they put out, they receive a reward for. And that's not something we should look down upon them for. That's one reason I'm not a communist, because I don't think I should be able to take what belongs to you, your work, your time, your energies. I don't think it's rightly mine. But he says, when we work, we make it so that others don't have to give to us by their energy and their, their hard work. But that's not all that scripture has to say about it. As I said, we live in a fallen world. Not everybody can work. Not everybody is able. So he says, Acts 20, 35, In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So here's the principle. You work hard so that you provide for what you need. And so that you don't depend on others to give, to, to supply you with what you need. And so that you have, so that you can give to those who cannot 
work. That's a redemptive principle in regards to work that we Christians need to learn. There's another redemptive principle, and it comes, I was thinking about this actually in the way to church this morning. I thought about changing my whole sermon, but I don't think I will. Remember Mephibosheth in the Old Testament, uh, 2 Samuel 4. Uh, Saul and Jonathan have been killed in the battlefield, and uh, Ishbosheth, Jonathan's son, is killed in chapter 4. It's sort of the fall of Saul's house is what we see. And then one of Jonathan's son, his nurse is running with him. Probably she's just scared of what's going to happen to them now that Saul and Jonathan have died. Now David is ascending to the throne. In those days, it was not uncommon that the upcoming king would destroy the household of the, you know, the, uh, the, the outgoing king to make it known, especially if you were a different tribe and in different uh, a, a people group or whatever the, the difference was that you make it clear I'm the king. The house of Benjamin, Saul is no more. So maybe she's running because of that. Well, she trips and falls, drops Mephibosheth, and he's paralyzed. And, and what you get when you leave that chapter is that Saul's house is done. They are finished. You know, Saul is a, he's a terror, isn't he? trying to murder David for nothing. He's a wicked man. And you just sort of say, you're, you got what's coming to you. And yet, a few chapters later, after David is enthroned in Jerusalem, he brings the, the Ark of the Covenant there. He has victories over his enemies. In chapter 9, he says, is there anyone left of the house of Jonathan who he loved as a brother that I could show love to? And Ziba tells him, yes, there's one, and he's lame. He has nothing. He, you know, he's living basically in isolation. He's trying to hide from you, and I know where he lives. And you know the story. David goes, and he gives to Mephibosheth essentially everything that belongs to, belong to Saul and Jonathan. He gives him entire inheritance, but he says, but you Zebul will tend to that inheritance. Mephibosheth eats at my table. He's m essentially my son. He adopts him. So here's somebody with nothing. And David, with all that is rightfully his, says, Mephibosheth, you will share with what's mine. And that's not just this feel-good story from the Old Testament to stand alone. That's a picture of what gospel grace does to work to those who have. You see, that's a picture really of God's love. What does Matthew, what does Jesus teach about God's love? He sends rain on the just and the unjust. And then he tells us, be ye perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect. And so the category of work is work hard. Gain what you have. Make sure you have it so that you don't require others to give to you, but be prepared to give. Why? And the greatest illustration is because God gave to us first. What happened in the garden? Adam, he, after he was formed, did he just make his own way? No, God gave him everything he needed. Sometimes people need help in order to work. That's one way we help people, is we give them a way to work. But more importantly, redemptively, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says, regarding the riches of God that were in Christ, that he, though he was rich, he became poor. He became poor so he would be like us, so that in his poverty, we might become rich. That was the greatest gift, the gift of Christ's Son. You know, today on Father's Day, we need to celebrate this day by praying for those who don't have fathers. That's one way we need to pray today. Our, as I said, our society doesn't honor fathers, and less and less fathers are around. What about those children? 
True religion and undefiled is that you visit, visit the widows and the fatherless in their affliction. And thereby we show the mercy of God. We show through our work that we can give to those who don't have fathers or who fathers are absent. And yet we show by our grace the salvation that's come to us by grace of God and his work of redemption through Christ. Second, man of obedience. Verses 15 and seven through 17 of chapter 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. The Westminster Shorter Catechism question 10 says, how did God create man? Our kids know that, I think. How did God create man? He made man male and female after his own image in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness with dominion over the creatures. Adam was created righteous. It was our first estate. It was what man was supposed to be righteous to obey God was what we were created to do and we know he failed and no we are not perfect men none of us but if we are in Christ Jesus we are a new creation the scripture says the old things have passed away behold all things have become new the Bible says in Romans 6 18 that those who are under the reigning influence of the grace of God through Jesus Christ are no longer slaves of sin. We are free from sin in its mastery over us, having become slaves of righteousness. So men, here's what I want. The second thing I want you to hear from the creation mandate is that men, to be men, need to be righteous, obedient to God. Now, what does that look like? It looks like obeying the two great commandments. Love the Lord. We read it this morning in our responsive reading. The Shema. Love your neighbor as yourself. It has to do with obeying the word of God. Men, is that the passion of your heart? What, what is the passion of your heart in the home? What is the conduct of your life that you want your children to see? That you want them to know? It ought to be righteousness. It ought to be obedience to God. You can teach your children all till you're blue in the face. And if you are not obedient to God yourself, you will discourage godliness in them. You will discourage faith in them. Righteousness is essential for men to be men. You know, (laughs) I'm from Montana, and I always thought, you know, I want to be a mountain man one day. Well, I didn't always think of that. Later in life, I sort of started thinking of that. And mountain men, they have beards, and they, they walk, you know, like this, and they have guns all over themselves, and they have chaw. That's what we called it. You know, they have tobacco, and they spit all the time, and... And they have cowboy hats, and that's a man. And no one's going to argue that's not manly here this morning. I'm not. <laughs> but, but, but we, what does masculine mean? Oh, there's toxic ma- masculinity. Righteousness is manliness. Y- you know, one of the things that Pilate said, and he said it in a demeaning way when Jesus was before him, He said it to mock Jesus. He said, behold the man. And he never said anything more true. Jesus is the man. And he's righteous. You want to be a man? You want to be a father? Obey God. Third, And this is, this is encompassing of the previous two, man of responsibility. Genesis is clear that Adam was given these mandates to work the garden and to obey God. 
God gave him these mandates. Before Eve was created, he gave him these mandates. In both of them, God holds Adam especially responsible. We know that as the covenant head of mankind. Now, certainly men and women should both work. And certainly men and women should both do what's righteous. We should both be obedient to God. But the responsibility is laid on Adam in the order of things. In Genesis 2, 19 through 23, Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon man. And while he slept, he took one of the ribs and closed it up in his place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this is the last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Now, Paul uses that order that we just read there to describe how responsibility was given to both the home and the church to the man. Now, that does not mean that women have nothing to say and nothing to give. God made women because it was not good that man would be alone. To, sh to bear that responsibility himself was not necessarily good. But man is answerable, primarily speaking, as the responsible party in leadership, according to the word of God, both in work and in righteousness. And we know that, don't we? Because Adam, although Eve had eaten the fruit first, Eve is not charged with the fall of mankind. With the responsibility of plunging man, human beings, made in God's image, into death. That charge comes on Adam, Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man. And it has nothing to do with ability. It has nothing to do with the skill set. It has everything to do with the way God created us male and female. And this pattern is held throughout scripture and it's one that e i speak to every man here this morning if you shirk it if you shirk this responsibility of work and righteousness and if you give the responsibility that god has put on you you do not get rid of your responsibility before god he will still hold you as the responsible party all you do is upend his created purpose for you and your spouse for you and anyone who has he has placed you in charge over you know the upending of our society today is not the fault of women it's not the fault of the feminist movement although i think the feminist movement is a corrupting influence on our society it's not the fault of women it's not the fault of that movement or that ideology it is the fault of men capitulating and so we have to understand something nothing's going to change in our society in the trajectory that it is moving unless men see how God has created us to be responsible now as I said before that doesn't mean I disregard my wife God has given her to me as a helper suitable for me that I need and I depend on her dearly but when push comes to shove and a decision needs to be made whether I say you can make the decision or not I'm the one that's going to be held responsible for it as the father as a man 
These creation principles are essential. We are called to work. We are called to obey God. And we are called to bear responsibility. And I just ask you this morning, do you see the importance of this? You say, maybe, oh, it's not fair that I'm held responsible. It's not, in fact, it's not fair that Adam was held, we're held responsible for Adam's sin. Well, the problem with that is that God doesn't hold you responsible for your sin because he holds Christ responsible for it. You see, the whole idea of federal headship and responsibility is the whole reason why God pronounces you as a sinner justified because he held Jesus he condemned Jesus on the cross for your sin he held Jesus responsible for you as your federal head as husbands we are federal heads covenantal heads in our family God will hold us responsible men for how we lead for how we act how we work. Same goes for the church. Let's pray. Our Father.